Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this really important occasion, the 41st annual presidential lecture. And I'm delighted to be in this venue, this important place and space. And I want to thank Abby Chen for her wonderful performance. She is a, yeah, go ahead, clap for her. She is an incredible doctoral student in our School of Music, and you can tell that we attract amazingly Italian, talented students. And Abby, I know you're probably not supposed to do this as a performer, but would you just turn around and let everybody see your face? There you go. Abby's going to perform one more piece for us before we get started. Please. Thank you again to Abby Chen. President James O. Friedman established the Presidential Lecture Series 41 years ago. For more than four decades now, the lecture has showcased outstanding faculty members from across the entire university. This lecture series has served to encourage communication across disciplinary boundaries and it's brought the work of our faculty scholars to the general public. Not only does the lecture honor our superb faculty members, but it also demonstrates our commitment to sharing knowledge with the community, both inside the university and to audiences in the broader community outside of our walls and our spaces. So it opens us up to the broader community in ways that a lot of other things do too, but this is an academic example. This year, our lecture theme is Pathways to Discovery. All disciplines have their own principles of academic rigor. 
their own research processes, and even their own criteria for what constitutes truth. As well, truth always evolves with more information, more data, and more understanding. Academic pursuits become even more complicated when researchers and institutions try to communicate their discoveries to the public at large. We definitely saw this during the pandemic. Today, two of our most distinguished faculty members will explore the academically rigorous processes of their disciplines, public health and law. They will talk to us about how you pursue truth in their disciplines and what they face as challenges when they try to bring their discoveries to the general public. Our speakers, Christopher Coffey and Christina Tilley, will each make their presentations, and then I will engage in a discussion with both of them afterward. And when the program is finished, please join us for a reception to honor our distinguished lecturers. Our first speaker is Christopher Coffey, who is a professor of biostatistics and director of the Clinical Trials Statistical and Data Management Center in the College of Public Health. Professor Coffey has over 20 years of experience providing data management and statistical support to multi-center clinical trials and biomarker studies. He currently serves as the principal investigator of the Data Coordinating Center for the Network for Excellence in Neuroscience Clinical Trials, or NeuroNext. It's a lot of words, so we always have acronyms. He's also co-PI of the Clinical Coordinating Center for the Acute to Chronic Pain Signatures Program. And he serves as the head of the Statistics Core for the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. Professor Coffey is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the American Academy of Neurology, and the Society for Clinical Trials. He currently serves on several data and safety monitoring boards for academic and industry trials, and he has published extensively in the areas of adaptive designs and general clinical trial design. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Coffey. Right. First, let me say uh, thanks to President Wilson for the great introduction, and I'm honored to be giving this. Thanks to Chris and Tom, Amanda, everyone else who worked behind the scenes uh, to do this. So this, it's, it's a, a, an honor to be here uh, to speak with you today. So our general theme, you know, pathways to discovery, clinical, legal trials, academic rigor, and public perceptions. Interestingly, when we first found this out, we'll say, uh, you know, they brought Christine and I together to find common ground in our two disciplines, and you kind of think, you know, public health, clinical trials, law, and it was actually way easier than we thought it was going to be. So I think whether you're in for public health, clinical trials, or in law, I think these two talks share a lot of similarities. So I will start with, I used this as a title slide for a presentation that I gave in public health several years ago, which illustrates, so in, in my world, we do a lot of what is data coordinating center. If you don't know what a data coordinating center is, I will explain that. But a lot of it is similar to if you're a fan of Stranger Things, sitting there looking into the, the abyss. And so I will try to address you know, some of that today. I will start off by saying, as uh, President Wilson introduced, I'm a professor of biostatistics, so I'm a statistician. When you introduce yourself as a statistician, you typically get one of two reactions, either a look of sheer horror, or the more common is, oh, statistics, that was the worst class I had in undergrad. <laughs> Right? So my goal with this, I like to set realistic goals. This may not be the best presentation you have ever heard, but my goal is this will either be one of, if not the best presentation you've ever heard a statistician give, right? So <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna calibrate here, right? So looking at this, looking into kind of the abyss, what, what is the world we live in and what does it mean in terms of data coordinating center and clinical trials? So you know, if you pick up 
I would say newspaper, but I guess that would date me, or you go to social media or anything, there are results from various clinical trials that come out every year. Um, this, is, this is good that we get those out, but one of the hard parts about the way it comes in these little sound bites uh, when you're looking at this is it's often hard to know where it stands in the process. So much like the way a, a legal trial proceeds, the clinical, tri clinical trials process proceeds in an organized manner. So I pulled here three random headlines that I found, but these mean very different things if you're a patient who has the disease that's being studied or you're someone interested in the disease area. You know, so the first here with the HIV vaccine candidate is what we call a phase one trial. The second, the AbV study is a phase two trial and the Alzheimer's is a phase three trial. I'll explain a bit more about what that means, but the context, and if I'm a patient and I'm looking at this, what that means with respect to when treatment or drug might be available to me is, means a very different thing depending on the context here. So in this case, the Alzheimer's drug is phase three, which means it's closer to perhaps going to FDA, who approves drugs in the United States, to be available. No matter how positive the results in phase one and phase two are, it means there's additional testing that would need to be done before it would be available to a patient population. So a lot of times, I think the general population trying to read these may read a very positive headline and think this is a drug that will be coming when it may be five, six, seven, ten, a dozen years before, even if everything works out. So what are phase one, phase two, and phase three trials? This is a very simplified discussion, but in general, phase one trials tend to be trials that look solely at safety, um, either in a healthy population or individuals with the disease, depending upon the context. Typically, these would be trials done in healthy populations where you're trying to see this is a novel drug, that has probably had promising results in animal studies, but has never been given in humans before. And so the interest is what happens in humans and typically how high can we go before bad things happen? Because we typically assume, although not always, but most of the time, the higher we can dose, the better the chance for efficacy, but also the higher the risk of safety. And so these types of studies are studies that I would likely not be in. These are the type of studies that if you saw a flyer in the IMU, that says want to make like, you know, $500,000 over a weekend, you know, healthy college kids might go in, they take the drug on a Friday afternoon, their blood is drawn every hour for 24 hours, and you're trying to monitor what happens to them. The idea at phase one is to see, is it safe? Can we identify a target dose where it's safe so we know where to hone in on future testing? Phase two is what we call proof of concept. So if a drug has come through as safe, in phase two, we're doing slightly larger studies, almost always in the disease population, sometimes randomized with a control group, sometimes not, but we're looking for something that's called proof of concept there. Getting more information on the safety of the drug and starting to look at efficacy of the drug. Not necessarily can we show efficacy, but really the focus here is benefit risk. And a lot of what we do in phase two studies is what would be known as a go-no-go -no -go decision, where we would decide, is there enough evidence here to justify moving forward to the large confirmatory phase three trial, which is kind of the end of the road. Now the phase three trial, which would be the Alzheimer's example that I had on the slide above, is intended to be the definitive study. The idea is when you start that, you should know kind of everything you need to design that trial. And at the end of the day, this trial will tell you, yes, this is a promising drug. No, this is not a promising drug. Going to phase three is very expensive, both in terms of time and money, in terms of do this. These are often large, multi-center trials with hundreds if not thousands of patients in them. You want to make sure that you know everything you need to to make sure you're not wasting the resources because failing at phase three is very difficult both to the researcher, to the company, but in particular to uh, you know, patients who may be optimistic that the drug might work. So in general, phase one, phase two, the other way that this is often referred to as opposed to the numeric is phase one and phase two would be known as learning trials, where the idea in phase one and two is we're trying to learn what we need to know in order to better um, calibrate the phase three trial, whereas phase three is more of a confirming, right? That's the definitive step. So what we do a lot in the Clinical Trial Statistical Data Management Center, or CTSDMC, again, abbreviations are really big in academia and huge in clinical trials, is we often serve as a data coordinating center, clinical coordinating center for large multi-center clinical trials. This is a recent photo of our staff. We now have somewhere in the range of 40 staff members uh, working at the CTSDMC. The history of the CTSDMC goes back to 1989. This is a picture of three individuals who are extremely important uh, to everyone in the CTSDMC. Harold Adams, 
uh, who is still on faculty in neurology, who had a grant funded to do a clinical trial in TOAST, and worked with Bill Clark, who's in the middle, who has unfortunately passed away, uh, but was one of the directors of the clinical trial of the CTSDMC before I came here and had a huge influence on me and everyone else who came through the CTSDMC. And Skip Wilson on the left here, who was the uh, original director of the CTSDMC and also the founding director of biostatistics uh, in the College of P Public Health. So how Bill and Skip have their fingerprints on not just the CTSDMC, but a lot of things both in the field of neurology, uh, biostatistics, and clinical trials. Our structure is, so Data Coordinating Center involves not just statistics, which is kind of my expertise, but other things as well. So we have teams, we have a biostatistics team that does what you would expect, analyses, generating report. We have a data management team, which does data cleaning, which is incredibly important in clinical trials, querying data, setting up case report forms to make sure you're getting data in in a clean and organized manner. We have an IT development team that develops our electronic data capture system, a research support team, which provide all of the kind of behind the scenes things that are important to keep us going, and a study coordination team that handles the day-to-day -day coordination, safety monitoring, and so forth. What we do in an individual study may vary, but we're doing all of this, and if you think of the context that we're in, we're always working with a partner, right? In, in statistics, we have a phrase, being a statistician means you always get to play in someone else's backyard. As a data coordinating center, that's even more true. We're never really leading the study. There's almost always a PI. There's a, usually a clinical coordinating center who's, that's their scientific effort. We're the ones behind the scenes that are doing all of the things to make sure that the trial is running smoothly and we can get an adequate answer at the end. To go back to the Stranger Things reference, um, when I gave that talk uh, a few years ago, I was trying to think, what is the Data Coordinating Center like? And if you put it in the Stranger Things context, we're not the 11, we're not the Mike, we're not the ones that you think, we're the Dustin, right? So if you watch Stranger Things, we're the Dustin, the one behind the scenes, you know, Dustin's behind the scenes making sure everything is running smoothly. We don't see never-ending story, but we probably should. Um, if you, like, if you see Stranger Rings, you would get that reference. Um, but that is us. We're the Dustin behind the scenes, right? So that's kind of what the Data Coordinating Center does. Although if you ask me what a typical day in the DCC is, there is no typical day in the DCC, right? It depends on the studies. It depends upon what happens in the study. So a couple of things. It was started in 1989. In terms of how it expanded, there were really three key events that expanded both the size and the scope of us. In 2004, the CTSDMC was funded to serve as the clinical and data coordinating center for the Clinical Islet Transplant Consortium, or CIT. And then in 2011, uh, two big projects, Neuronext, which is, I'll talk about in, in a minute, a network to do uh, phase two trials in biomarkers and neurosciences. And then we also partnered with the Michael J. Fox Foundation to be the statistics score for PPMI or the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. In terms of what has happened, so that expanded the size, but also led to a lot of impactful and meaningful studies that we did. With CIT, this was a study to try to generate definitive evidence that transplanting healthy um, islet cells from a healthy pancreas, pancreas and then transplanting them into someone with type 1 diabetes would lead to improved um, uh, control of their type 1 diabetes and decreased instances of hypoglycemia. It involved several smaller studies, but a phase three study that showed pretty definitive results that islet, transpl islet transplantation was definitive and led to an FDA panel endorsing uh, islet transplants for, uh, phase one, uh, for, uh, for type one diabetes. So that was kind of a huge, uh, uh, a huge achievement. Francis Collins, who was the head of NIH at the time, actually sent out a tweet about the results when it came out. So it's always nice to have the head of NIH tweeting uh, about your center. PPMI study, this has been going on since 2011. It has generated an enormous amount of data and has exciting results coming out every day. Last year was one of the pivotal years. With that, based on the data that was collected in PPMI and based on analyses that many of the statisticians in our group led, including Michael Brum and David Eric LaFontaine, we were able to show that there is a, something called SAA, or uh, synuclein aggregate assay, that if you're positive on that, um, you tend to have Parkinson's. And the big breakthrough here is this can detect the presence of Parkinson's disease before someone is clinically diagnosed. So if anyone knows anyone with Parkinson's or has been around anyone with Parkinson's, by the time you're diagnosed, you've had symptoms for quite a while. 
Many people will develop like a small tremor, you put up with it, you can still do your job, you're not impacted. When it starts impacting your day-to-day -day or you can't do your job, that's when you go to the doctor, that's when you get diagnosed. But we've known for a long time that the disease doesn't start at diagnosis. This is now a definitive way to show that, which has led to a number of potential opportunities where now there are drug companies looking at pharmaceuticals that can treat the disease before you have enough of a motor disorder that you're clinically diagnosed, which even if it doesn't cure the disease, if those types of therapeutics can slow the progression so that you don't reach the more um, 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 complicating features of the disease or you never reach them, that would be a huge win. And so there's a lot of research looking at that. The big thing that is now being focused on, the only way you can measure it currently is through CSF, through a lumbar puncture but there's a lot of research to see can we develop a blood test or a urine test or some other way of capturing the information to make it much more feasible to do so on a daily basis. Uh, another study we worked on was the CHAMP study, which was interesting. This was a good example of a study where everyone thought they knew the answer going in, and it turns out no one thought, that, no one knew the answer at the end. This was a pediatric migraine study done with colleagues at Cincinnati Children's that was comparing two commonly used headache drugs, amitriptyline and topiramate or Topamax, in kids. There was a lot of controversy before whether this study should be done in that there had never been definitive clinical trials in kids with these drugs. There had been in adults, and there were kind of two schools of thought. One was headache is headache. If the drug treats headache in adults, it should treat headache in kids. The other school of thought was kids are not miniature adults. They're different, and what works in adults may or may not work in kids. So this study was set to first look at definitive evidence of whether these two drugs were better than a placebo, and then the thought was we'd be able to definitively show that, and then we could pair the two drugs head to head to see if one worked better than the other. What we found was there was no benefit of drug, but it wasn't your typical study where drug didn't show any benefit. 70% of the kids in the study improved, and improvement here meant your number of headache days, so how many days of a month you have a headache, was reduced by 50% or more. So if you came in, you were having 12 headaches per day at baseline, by the end of the study, you were having six or fewer. Right, so it's very impactful. If you cut somebody's headache days in half, you've cut like the impacts in terms of their quality of life. So kids got better, it just wasn't the drug. So those results came out. This suggests maybe you shouldn't be giving kids drugs, but we don't know what to do. Something was beneficial here. Was it the fact they were seeing the physician more because of being in the study who were reminding them, get sleep, drink water, other healthy habits with migraine? It isn't really known, but this was an example of a study that set out to answer one question, showed that that, that, you know, the, the treatments didn't work better than placebo, but it wasn't that they necessarily didn't work. Every group got better. What exactly got them better is something that is still an outstanding question. It led to a lot of debate within those who treat pediatric migraine. The last set of examples I want to talk about is Neuronex. This is a network we got involved with also in 2011 that was put in place by NINDS, or the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, to do phase two clinical trials and biomarker studies in the neural sciences. The advantage of this and one of the biggest struggles of this is unlike a lot of clinical trial networks, this covers anything under the umbrella of NINDS. So almost any neurological disorder, which there is a wide range of possible disorders. We have worked on things I had never heard of uh, before we got involved with this. Some of the studies that have finished, we finished two biomarker studies, one in spinal muscular atrophy and one in glioblastoma. So you can see there the differences in these. Uh, these are two very different diseases. In SMA, or spinal muscular atrophy, we did a biomarker study that looked at motor function. This enrolled uh, infants who had been developed with SMA within three to six months and healthy controls. And what it really showed was these measures of muscle development. So these SMA babies look healthy at birth, you're diagnosed with SMA within a few months, and then your muscles just don't develop normally. And this was able to kind of validate that with specific markers of muscle function, which was not involved in a clinical trial itself, but since it's very hard to do studies in this population, the data from these studies was made available at the time to a number of companies that were looking at therapeutics in the field to kind of enrich their placebo or control data sets and was part of the FDMA, FDA submissions that led to both the first drug for SMA and now I believe there are three approved drugs for SMA. So it went from a disease when we started the biomarker study that had no treatments to a disease now where there are treatments for someone uh, who is this. This also illustrates another component of, of clinical trials in that it's sometimes hard when you think about what is going on here. This is a disease where 
the, um, the mortality rate at two years for these babies is very high. And over half of the SMA babies enrolled in this study died, right? And so it's very hard when you think of that way. Babies, people dying in general is hard. Babies dying is really hard when you think about what is behind the data. But those families, especially in this case, because they weren't getting a therapeutic, were donating their time and effort and the measurements on their kids to inform things that led to improvements downstream, where kids with SMA that were born now have many more options and hopefully much better uh, possible outcomes than what was there for those families. So it, it kind of calibrates what we do. It's not just data. Every piece of data is somebody's mother, brother, mother, brother son, daughter, grandmother. And I think at times we have to step back and think of that and why we're doing all of this. Some phase two trials we've done in a number of different areas. One I specifically want to highlight too. One is NN 104. We use NN for neural next and then 101, 102, 103, because that's our creativity. Um, this was an acute stroke study looking at uh, a treatment that can be given with TPA or with thrombectomy uh, to determine whether this was meaningful to look at. We looked at the study and found that there was a um, you could dose it safely, and also in animal models, there had been some suggestion of a, uh, a reduction in the risk of bleeding. So TPA, which many of you may have heard of, one of the common treatments for stroke, is very effective, but carries a slight risk of, of, of increased bleeding rate. So in a small percentage of people, it can be harmful. This was thought to kind of diminish that risk. The study was positive, led to a GO decision, and is now the larger, more definitive studies being done in a separate uh, network called StrokeNet. We just wrapped up a study in Fragile X syndrome. Um, so Fragile X syndrome is another relatively rare disorder where these kids have um, development uh, issues where they um, struggle with uh, speaking and with other behavior type issues. The idea of this study was that th this language intervention, if given with a therapeutic, would lead to, would, the therapeutic would enhance kids' ability to retain the training from the therapeutic, uh, from the language intervention and would improve their language abilities. The study did not show any effect, and in fact, it pretty much definitively addressed this with other things that, that had been done prior, that this model did not work. This was a model that looked promising in animal studies and could never replicate in human studies. I put this up to show, this is an example of a study that did not give the result that the patient community or the researchers wanted, but still definitively answered the question. And part of our role as a data coordinating center or statisticians is to set up studies that answer the questions of interest. Sometimes it might be what we want it to be, sometimes it might not be what we want it to be, but if we have answered the question, does this drug work, yes or no, and we're pretty confident in the result at the end, that's a positive study. A negative study is one that is not designed properly so we get to the end and we're not clear exactly what the data show us. So we don't know if the non-significant finding or the lack of efficacy is due to a drug that didn't work, or due to the fact that we did not design the study properly. So part of our role early on is to make sure we're designing the studies to address those questions. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here to talk about some of the context. So we think of, as scientists, this world of science and truth, as we mentioned before, but the truth in science is also driven by other things. When I design a clinical trial, I'm looking at it mostly from science but there is also other things that influence. One particular thing that drives clinical trial design is the regulations around clinical trials and the regulations of getting drugs approved. In the United States, in the early 1900s, this was a typical drug ad. The reason it was, there was no regulatory oversight of, clinic, of drugs in the United States in the early 1900s. You could put anything as a potion, you could go around, you could give it away, you could sell it, you could tell people it cured whatever. Right, so everything was claimed to be cured. There was no regulation. It wasn't until 1906 that the Pure Food and Drug Act was put in place, and then 1912, the Shirley Amendment. This was the first legislation in the US related to drugs, and all this really did was you had to be, at first, you had to be upfront with what was in your drug, and the second was that you could not label a medication with false therapeutic claims that were intended to defraud the purchaser. What that means is I can't tell you my drug works if I know it doesn't work. What that left vague was if I don't know if it works or not, I can tell you it works because I don't know that it doesn't work. A famous trial that led to a real shift in regulatory thinking was related to this drug called Banbar. Banbar was a drug to treat um, diabetes. Well, 
I say drug loosely. It was a proposed drug. There was nothing in it that actually worked, but it was given to type 1 diabetics who were told this would treat your diabetes better than insulin, which was available at the time. People stopped taking insulin, were taking this drug. This, the government seized it, and then this went to a court case where the company had, had, and the government were fighting over whether the government had the right to withdraw it. During the trial, the company lawyers pre presented letters that many individuals with diabetes had sent to the company that made Banbar, telling them how happy they were with the drug and how much better they were doing with the drug. The government lawyers then matched those letters with death certificates of people who had died from complications of diabetes. But it was ruled by the court, and rightfully so based on the law, that the government had no right to withdraw it because the company's argument was because the company had these letters that were telling them the drug worked, they believed it worked, so they did, they did not knowingly defraud the purchaser. Of course, you can imagine this created a big outrage, and this led to the movement towards what we know today as regulatory science, which is 1938, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, which first gave FDA the ability to oversee safety, and then 1962, which expanded that to say that the government had the right that you had to show that a drug was safe and effective before it could be approved in the United States. So think about that for a moment. 1962 was not that long ago, right? Many of us have family members who were alive in 1962. Before 1962, you did not have to show a drug was efficacious to market it in the United States. That's amazing when you step back and think of that, right? So now, to get a new drug approved, you have to show that it's safe and efficacious. This is where you get away from the pure science. What is safe and efficacious is a bar that may vary over time. This is where things like precedents come into play by what FDA, what standard FDA is holding at the time. And under different administrations, under different leadership at FDA, that can change somewhat. And so the FDA, regu the regulatory decision framework is both geared by science and that we want to show what is beneficial, but also by precedent or what we think the bar is at FDA. There are times when it may be higher. There are times when, and when I say lower, I don't mean lower as in it doesn't work, but what is the level of threshold risk benefit that you would need to show. This has led to arguments, and in recent times, we've kind of gone in the opposite direction, and you could have a lot of debate over this. This is too short to get into a lot of the, the aspects of this, but should the same threshold be applied to all diseases, right? A disease with current therapeutics, maybe you need a higher threshold to get a new thing approved. A disease with nothing available should have a lower threshold. This has led to things like accelerated approval, um, a, a process where you can get a drug approved through something called accelerated approval, where instead of the typical showing benefit on a clinical endpoint, you can show on a surrogate endpoint in order to verify that the drug works. A recent example of that being su used successfully was aducanumab, or the drug for Alzheimer's that got a lot of press when it was approved. The history of this is quite interesting. So in, when it went to FDA in November of 2020, an FDA advisory board, so this is a panel of scientists, independent scientists reviewed the data and voted 10 no and one uncertain as to whether the drug works or not based on the evidence. So there was very limited evidence that the drug worked based on this panel, but FDA approved it anyway, right? So this was highlighted at the time. A lot of people were excited because this was the first new Alzheimer's drug in a while. A lot of people were upset because they felt that the science did not reflect that. After that, Cleveland Clinic and Mount Sinai announced they would not um, prescribe it due to these concerns. Three members of the FDA advisory board resigned. Uh, the most impactful thing was probably in April 2022 when CMS announced that they would not cover the drug unless you're involved in a clinical trial. This is a very expensive drug, and it would have been, I think, over a third of the CMS budget if it had been implemented with that. And so just this past January, Biogen announced that they are tr uh, terminating their post-marketing clinical study and giving up rights to the drug. So in some ways, it, not having drugs is bad. Having drugs that no one can get access to is somewhat worse. So how this would all play out is something that has to be addressed. In recent years, there was also a movement, federal right to try. So if someone, if a drug is safe and someone is willing individually to take on the risk, can they take it? That was kind of right to try. And taking it even a step further, this is a fascinating example that involves Iowa. So 
in kind of beyond right to try. This is a, a, a woman named J.C. Hermstad, I hope I'm saying her name right, who lives, I believe, in western Iowa. She had a twin sister who had died of ALS. They both have a specific genetic type of ALS. Her twin sister died of ALS. She was diagnosed with ALS. ALS is a disease where often, particularly with the type they had, the mor mortality rate is high. There was a drug that it showed promising results in animals, never been given to humans. Even under right to try, it has to be shown safe in humans. She wanted to try the drug, went to court to get the uh, permission to, tr to uh, try the drug, and was successful in getting the drug. So you can see here in June of 2019, she got the first dosage of the drug. She died a year later. So this leads to a number of things when debating this. Did the drug help her? It's hard to say. She was pretty maybe too advanced when she got this. She didn't, but in looking at what has happened since, the data from her and what the drug did within her helped to further the development of the drug, which has moved forward, is now in phase three clinical testing and is named for her. So the drug has now been named because she basically, the data she collected helped inform this. How the phase three trial will turn out, we won't know until it finishes, but it's an interesting story that kind of lays into a lot of things that are at the center of debates in a lot of different places, but is, yes, we want government oversight in terms of we don't want drugs that don't work or are unsafe you know, being made available, but where does the individual aspect of that come into play? And in that if I know a drug is safe and it may or may not work in me, should I have access to the drug? Those are questions that I think in the next five, 10 years will be very hotly debated. And how that plays out is something that no one can predict. And it kind of depends upon, do we see really bad things or really positive things come out of some of these precedents? So I will close with just saying one, thank you. One, this is a pictures I could find of CTSDMC over the years. There's a number of CTSDMC members here. I wanted to thank them because none of this work would be possible without the talented individuals who dedicate their time and energy to the CTS DMC every day. It's a great place to work. Um, it's a great group to work with. And the people put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, literally, to make these studies work. And in a day-to-day, -day, it seems like almost at sometimes overwhelming. But when you step back and look at what we're able to impact, it helps. My grandmother had, al had Alzheimer's. My mom had dementia. Many of you have probably had somebody in your family diagnosed with disease, and when that happens, you want to know what can I do, right? The fortunate thing that we have, maybe not in the disease that affects us individually, but we can do something in some disease that somebody out there is probably asking that question today. So that's something that we take, that we don't take for granted and really makes coming to work something that we, uh, that we love doing every day. I also want to thank um, my wife, Elizabeth, and son Thompson, who is here. So with my wife, Elizabeth, none of this would be possible without her. She supported me. She was willing to move to Iowa from the south. Um, she still gets a little cranky every winter when it snows about that. But that leads to one last thing just that I will close with. I also want to thank the 1991 Iowa Hawkeyes basketball team. So there are a lot of important shots in Iowa Hawkeye basketball history, including Caitlin Clark's you know, logo uh, shot from last week. This is from the 1991 NCAA tournament. And what this shot here is, is a shot that probably no one who's an Iowa, a diehard Iowa basketball fan probably doesn't remember this shot, but this may be the biggest shot in my life. I was an East Tennessee State fan growing up in East Tennessee State. In 1991, ETSU had the best team they had had in a long time. They played Iowa in the first round of the NCAA tournament. I'm an NCAA tournament junkie, wanted to watch basketball all day. This is James Winters putting in a putback off of a missed Chris Street shot that gave Iowa the lead for good against East Tennessee State with 422 left in the game that they went on to win. That led to me getting so pissed off that I did not want to watch basketball for the rest of the day and decided to turn the TV off and go to this mixer that my fraternity was having that I had not planned to go, and I met my wife that evening. So I owe my marriage to Iowa basketball winning that game in 1991. Thank you. It all comes back to Iowa basketball, doesn't it? I don't know. Thank you, Chris. That was a fascinating talk. We're glad you're at Iowa and even uh, more appreciative of your 
really careful description of clinical trial work. It's so important to us all. Our next speaker is Christina Tilley, who is the Claire Ferguson Carlson Fellow at the University of Iowa College of Law. She teaches tort and constitutional law with a particular emphasis on defamation and speech injuries. Professor Tilley's work focuses on how top-down justice commands from federal courts and agencies produce only superficial representations of justice. She advocates for community conversations and for shifting many legal questions away from judges and back to juries. Her work has appeared in the Yale Law Journal, the Northwestern University Law Review, and the Journal of Tort Law. Professor Tilly clerked for Judge Richard D. Cudahy at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Court. She was a member of the Appellate Litigation Group at Mayor Brown, where she worked on asbestos litigation, securities, class action issues, and First Amendment matters. Prior to her law degree, she was a news reporter specializing in business and legal affairs at United Press International and other publications. Please welcome Christina Tilley. Well, thank you so much, President Wilson, for that great introduction. And thank you also, Tom and Kristen, and especially Ben and Eric, um, for bringing everything to this stage today. It's, it's great to be here with everybody. Um, and it's been really fascinating and a little intimidating learning more about Chris's work over these past weeks, because Chris and his colleagues deal with uh, actual facts in the real world that we might not like, medical conditions and so forth, and they leverage their expertise about other facts in the real world as interventions to produce quantifiably better results for individuals and for society. In contrast, I and my law scholar colleagues are dealing with a system that is entirely the product of human imagination. Um, it is not a fact of nature, but rather an article of faith that our legal system is designed correctly and is working well. And faith, it turns out, is a sometime thing when it comes to the law. Only one in four Americans say that they uh, believe they'll get a reliable result when they go to their local courthouse. And in a recent survey, uh, lawyers were identified as the profession that contributes the least to society. So aside from bruising my ego as a member of that profession, um, this gives me pause for the future of the legal system and, um, dare I say it, for the future of the United States itself. Um, and that is because, as Justice uh, John Harlan told us 60 years ago, having a system that identifies the rights and obligations that members of a community owe to each other is essential to producing social cohesion. That cohesion is virtually impossible without a working legal system. Um, uh, and that social cohesion actually does cash out in the impacts in the real world that our colleagues, well, I guess I am across the river, but over at the Boyd Law Building, we would refer to you all as being across the river, um, that you can quantify and measure. Social cohesion has been shown to support health, both physical and mental. It has been shown to support informal social coordination on a daily basis that allows people to maximize goal pursuit while simultaneously minimizing the injurious impact of what they're doing. And it's been found to support um, a thriving commercial marketplace um, where transactions can take place seamlessly and meet the needs of people with goods and services that they want and will pay for. All of that can happen informally when you have social cohesion without requiring the state to come in with some kind of expensive or potentially oppressive intervention. So a good legal system turns out to be a cornerstone of good living. Um, but a legal system is only considered good or legitimate by the people using it 
when they feel that it reflects back to them some of the basic purposes and values in their own lives. Um, and so my work really looks at the question of how we can deepen the connection between members of the community and the legal system that, at least in theory, is supposed to be serving them. And the answer that I've come up with over the past many years is that it's time to revitalize a sector of the law that is in some disuse and, and in some disrepute, frankly, these days, and that is personal injury law, uh, or as we call it over at Boyd, tort law. Um, now, if you're ever up at three in the morning and you see commercials for, you know, mesothelioma lawsuits, you probably think you know what tort law is, but I want to redefine it this afternoon for you. In my mind, tort law is the place where neighbors tussle with neighbors over how they're supposed to treat each other in the course of a regular day. On the ground, um, how are we supposed to deal with the real problems that one-on-one -on -one confrontations compose? So before I talk more about that, let's learn about what some of the real problems are that Americans feel they're facing and the real values that they would like to have uh, served. What's your problem? Uh, the rents are done too high in New York. Weather. Money. My problem, the train. Two to three hours in traffic. My daughter. Full parking tickets. My 8 a.m. class. Commuting in the cold. Oh, wife and problems as usual. Um, right now I think it's skincare. I hate long pants. Late paychecks. Sleep. Student loans. Ben Carson. The person who leans on the pole on the subway. Too many people getting married. My apartment's a little too small. I'm single. I don't like the cups. I hate the smell of pissy subways. The Kardashians. I can't afford tea. That's my problem. Oh. <laughs> my nagging girlfriend. Gluten. I'm gonna say myself and cats. The Yankees. Loser men who come into your life and suck at all your energy and steal your joy. I call. My apartment's too small and my furniture's too big. I have too many kids. Well, a little sciatic pain, but that's okay. I cannot lose no weight. Processed foods. Crooked lawyers. No fault insurance. Nobody writes letters anymore. My landlord. The weather. I have a one mega million. Discrimination today. Not enough pumpkins. My commute. The rent. Shallow people. My phone sucks. My four kids don't want to do homework. My boyfriend's attitude is my problem. Fake yeah. Mets fans. I hate it when men spread their legs on the subway. Texting at sporting events. My husband has expensive taste. I have jury duty today. Law school. Carmelo Anthony. I need a boyfriend. Crazy people. Peanut butter in my beard. Donald Trump. My ex-son-in-law. College loans. Tuition. Mental illness. When the sheets come out from the end of your bed, and then they get all tangled. Mm -hmm. Men over 40. Two jobs at 60. Winter approaching. I don't like gerbils. MCATs. I got debris in my hair. Parking. My children don't listen. A broke ass man. People. College is boring. Break dancers. What's your problem with break dancers? Too much movement. My problem is that I'm not Beyonce. Time Warner Cable. Midterms. I'm too fat. I don't have enough pretty women at the moment, but I will have them. Breastfeeding in public. The subway. It smells. I be Johnson. Homework. I hate when people smile excessively. Politicians. I don't make enough money to support my shopping habits. My boyfriend's never seen the movie Grease, so that's a big problem. Naked people on the subway. Chase Utley, hate that guy. I'm pregnant. My mother-in-law. What's your problem? What's your problem? My upstairs neighbors. What's your problem? It's fine, but I, I'm from Scotland. I don't know where I am and I really need the toilet, okay? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so real American problems. I've gone ahead and made those look a little bit more scientific. I've put them in a bar graph. Um, leading the way are uh, family and romantic entanglements, followed by economic concerns, often having to do with education or health, followed by transportation concerns, problematic strangers in private life, and a variety of other miscellaneous concerns, including the inability to be Beyonce. Um, well, the law can never turn me, or you, I think, into beyond, um, but it can address most of these other problems. And it can do that from one of two directions. It can either do that with top-down behavioral commands that are issued by some state actor, that might be a legislature, might be a government agency like the FDA, or it might be a judge um, telling people or classes of people that they must do something or they can't do something. 
But the other way that the law can intervene to assist in some of these problems is through bottom-up development of informal social norms. And this typically happens when somebody who feels they've been injured in some way goes into court, complains about their injury, and asks members of the community to come in and agree, yes, you're entitled to some recognition, you're entitled to some recourse. And that just doesn't resolve the dispute between those two people. It also surfaces and signals to the broader community what we prefer or disfavor about informal social behavior. So that's another way that the law can sort of get at some of these problems. So if we look at our 99 problems one more time, we can organize them into a Venn diagram, and what we see is that there are really virtually no problems that couldn't benefit from both top-down legal interventions and bottom-up legal interventions. Let me give you an example, transportation. So if your transportation problem is that these days, when you're driving around, you think that people are not paying enough attention to the road, they are weaving in and out of lanes, or going too fast or too slow because they are scrolling on their phone, you might look for a top-down legal intervention. Uh, the legislature might pass a law uh, setting a speed limit or prohibiting cell phone use in the car. Um, they might fund the Johnson County Sheriff to pull over our favorite law professor as she's looking for a podcast driving down Burlington Road, write her a ticket and make her pay a fine. That would be an effective way to get her to do what she's supposed to do. Um, but there's another way to do that. Now, had she sideswiped somebody, didn't happen, could have happened. If it had, that person could hail me into court and say, you know what? You've injured me, and you did it because you acted like your entertainment pleasure was somehow more important than my well-being as an equal occupant of the road. And if a jury came in and said, yeah, we think that was pretty careless and that you kind of treated her as less than this person in the other car, they could make me compensate her and they could also simultaneously signal to the greater Johnson County community, that's kind of shameful behavior. And, and you're kind of persona non grata, Professor Tilly. You really shouldn't be doing that. And that is a different kind of intervention and, and one that, uh, that has a different kind of traction uh, to individuals. So, um, the problem, I would say, in modern American law is that we have shifted. Um, historically, most social conflicts were treated through these kinds of bottom-up, jury trial, neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor tussles. Uh, but over the past century, we've gone from a jury-centric way of treating these problems towards a much more judge-centric way of treating them. Why is that? Uh, there are lots of reasons, but there are two primary ones that I'm going to call out today. One of them has to do with the efforts and the interests of uh, lawyers at the turn of the century who began to suspect that the ability to get neighbor-on-neighbor -neighbor recourse was very much burdened or very much contingent on the race, gender, and social class of the person who was seeking recognition. Um, at the time, local state juries formally and informally excluded women and people of color. So when you were asking juries to give you sort of a normative uh, response to how people are supposed to be treated, those normative answers tended to reflect a vero, very narrow worldview and, and to uh, perpetuate that worldview in a way that disadvantaged people um, of marginal classes. So these lawyers said, you know what, we, we are kind of kind of give up on this neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor way of seeking legal intervention, um, and we're going to turn to federal courts. Um, federal courts where life-tenured judges are free from social pressure that their state court counterparts might experience, and we're going to start telling some stories to those federal courts about things like racially restrictive housing covenants, um, segregated schools, oppressive monetary judgments against a vibrant national press. And we're going to tell those judges that these kinds of um, uh, systems are simply incompatible with some of the rights guaranteed in the Constitution, the rights to equality, the rights to free speech, and so forth. And it turns out that at mid-century, federal courts were very responsive to those stories. Uh, and they started issuing top-down behavioral commands to sort of remake some of these systems. Um, this was a heroic effort by the lawyers and the judges involved in it, and it is rightfully lauded. 
Um, but it did sort of teach a generation of lawyers that top-down commands and constitutional litigations were preferable and maybe the exclusive way to achieve social cohesion and to remake systems. Um, there was a second uh, uh, initiative that grew up alongside this shift to the federal courts, and that was the adoption in 1938 of a new set of rules to govern the conduct of civil trials. Um, these rules were designed to be scientifically efficient, and so it's no surprise that they really map on to the three-phase clinical trial system that Chris was just telling us about. Um, so under the new federal rules of civil procedure, which were then mimicked by states throughout the country, there are three phases to a civil trial. In phase one, somebody can go in and say, look, I've been injured, I, I need some, some compensation and some recourse, and a judge can look at that complaint and say, you know, I believe everything you're saying actually happened, but what you're complaining of just really doesn't rise to the level of a legal wrong, and so I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to leave the courthouse. You can't move on to phase two. So for example, if I went to court tomorrow and filed a lawsuit saying, President Wilson blinked at me yesterday afternoon, uh, a judge would very likely throw me out at phase one because she might say, I, I believe you, I'm sure she did blink at you yesterday. That simply is not a legal wrong. It never has been, it hasn't injured you in any way, and that's just simply too frivolous to go forward with. But if I made a claim uh, for something that I said was a legal wrong, that the judge thought might amount to a legal wrong, then the other party gets a chance to tell their story, which is probably pretty different. We're gonna collect evidence, and then the judge is gonna look at that evidence. Now, if the judge looks at all the evidence and says, I'm pretty sure I know what happened here, there are no genuine disputes of material fact. The judge gets a second opportunity to say, and based on that story that everybody pretty much agrees on, I still don't think that was a legal wrong. Again, I'm gonna be asked to hightail it right out of that courthouse, and I'm not gonna get the chance to go on to phase three, which is where we might invite a jury to come in. So the only cases that are going in front of juries are cases where the judge either isn't really sure what happened or isn't really sure whether it rises to the level of a legal wrong. Now, in personal injury law, we define legal wrongs in pretty conceptually broad, what I might call open textured terms. We're typically asking if somebody exercised reasonable care, or if a physical contact uh, was offensive, or whether a false statement could be considered defamatory. And as you can quickly grasp, uh, these concepts elude precise quantification. What they really are doing is asking, what are our local social norms? You know, what do we think is reasonable in Iowa? How do we drive reasonably in the snow? Um, what is considered an offensive contact? That might change over time as social norms change over time. And what is considered defamatory, what might cause the community to think less of somebody, is also probably context and geographic specific. Um, calling somebody a scab in Detroit is likely to have a very different impact than calling them a scab in, say, North Carolina, which is, I believe, a right to work state. So every time a judge dismisses a lawsuit at phase one or phase two, what they're really doing is saying, well, this is what reasonableness is. This is what the local community norm is. Um, and they're announcing that in a way that will then apply in future similar cases. So they are really declaring those community norms in sort of a long-term fashion, all, of course, without seeking community input before they do that. Now, why did the designers of these federal rules do it this way? Why did they give judges this kind of flexibility? Well, it turns out they trusted judges as experts in a way that they just didn't trust jurors. Um, some of them said that they thought jurors were ignorant uh, or too emotional to generate uh, good, fair outcomes, especially when the defendant was a large national commercial player uh, whose goods and services were so deeply embedded in a national marketplace that assigning excessively large um, compensatory obligations or forcing them to sort of invest too much in the safety of their products might either put them out of business or force them to price those products so dearly that they were beyond the reach of the average consumer. Um, so they, they felt that judges were just simply more 
um, trustworthy in generating the kinds of norms that were needed here. Um, so who are the judges? Uh, well, actually, before I get to who the judges are, let, let's look at how this has worked, this system. Um, pretty well, if you don't like juries. So in the 1930s, about 20% of all cases, civil cases, went in front of a jury. By 1962, that had fallen to 12%. In the year 2000, only 2% 2 of cases were going in front of juries. And by 2017, 0.7% of all civil trials actually went in front of a jury. Um, so who are the judges who are deciding a lot of these cases? Uh, how do they get to the bench? Well, sometimes they're appointed by a governor or a legislature. Sometimes they're elected. Occasionally a partisan election, sometimes a nonpartisan election, but usually they're slated by a party or by a group of interested lawyers. Demographically, they tend to be um, a little less diverse than the average uh, American population. They make more money and they are pr pretty educated compared to your average juror who makes quite a bit less money, tends to be uh, less degreed, and tends to be more diverse. Um, Okay, so I am not saying that systematizing the quest for social, equitable cohesion or market efficiency was a bad thing. I think it was morally urgent and economically expedient uh, in the 20th century where we saw explosive social change and economic growth that needed to be sort of channeled and curtailed into productive um, um, predictable, routinized systems. Uh, in fact, the need for a, a systematic, impersonal approach to managing the real problems of Americans was so deeply accepted by the popular imagination that in the 1970s, we hear this ethos embraced by one of the most notorious outlaws in American pop culture. Come in. Mwah. You're taking us very personal. Tom, this is business, and this man has taken it very, very personal. Where does it say that you can't kill a cop? Come on, Mikey. Tom, wait a minute. I'm talking about a cop that's mixed up in drugs. I'm talking about a, a, a dishonest cop, a crooked cop who got mixed up in the rackets and got what was coming. That's a terrific story. And we have newspaper people on the payroll, don't we, Tom? And they might like a story like that. They might. They just might. It's not personal, it's strictly business. So this strictly business ethos is very well accepted in the United States after several years shifting from a jury-centric approach towards a judge-centric approach. But social psychologists tell us that top-down commands um, are very good at making frameworks for systems, they're good at designing uh, potentially equitable housing systems, educational systems, workplaces. Uh, what they're not good at is penetrating the individual hearts and minds of the people who are living, learning, and laboring in those spaces. What moves that needle are opportunities to hear the personal narratives of people who are different than us uh, and to see those people as individuals um, to essentially humanize them rather than widgetize them, do the opposite of what a system does. And of course, that is exactly the exercise that we are going through when we conduct a jury trial. Uh, jury trials provide social goods that are in scarce supply these days, uh, and I'm gonna talk about three of them. First, they're good for litigants. Uh, a lot of surveys of litigants reflect that they do not go into court because they're looking for money and a big payday. That is, you know, their lawyers are maybe looking for that because that's a, how, how they cash out a little bit of money. But um, what they are really looking for is the kind of dignity that comes with an attentive audience of their peers listening to their story. Um, in the United States today, we have, you know, uh, an excessive number of places where we can uh, get talk uh, the jury is the one site in American government that is devoted to the powerful act of listening. Um, and as Elmo learned earlier this month with the benign social media query, how is everybody doing? 
Um, Americans are not doing fine. <laughs> they told Elmo that they feel left behind, they feel unseen, they feel isolated, they feel forgotten. Well, participating in a jury trial as a litigant is a place where you are seen, you are heard, and you are treated as worthy of conversation among your neighbors. Jury trials are also good for the jurors who participate in them. Uh, Alexei de Tocqueville, when he traveled the United States in the 19th century, wrote home to his countrymen about the wonder of the American jury. He called it a free school where men come together are, and are imbued with an enthusiasm for uh, shared uh, good living. Uh, he said it, it forces people to think about something other than themselves and thereby combats the selfishness that operates as a rust in society. Um, so jury trials are good for those people sitting in the jury box. They're also good for people who don't participate in the trial at all. Um, jury trials fortify that crucial public faith in the legitimacy of the legal system. In a recent study, uh, people reported by a margin of two to one that they trusted jurors more than judges to resolve questions appropriately. And when Americans were asked to imagine that their own interests were on the line, the majority of them said they would much rather have jurors than judges deciding the outcome of their case. Um, in fact, this yearning for the sort of personal one-on-one -on -one communication that is represented in a jury trial um, has become so prevalent in the United States that 20 years after Mario Puzo put the strictly business ethos into Michael Corleone's mouth, Nora Ephron struck back with uh, a competing point of view that she put into Kathleen Kelly's mouth. It wasn't personal. What, what is that supposed to be? I'm so sick of that. All that means is that it wasn't personal to you, but it was personal to me. It's personal to a lot of people. I mean, what is so wrong with being personal anyway? Uh, nothing. Because whatever else anything is, it ought to begin by being personal. So some of you may think that Meg Ryan is being a little soft-headed here and that my focus on humanizing uh, the law may seem a little soft-hearted, but I will remind you that personal faith in the legal system translates into social cohesion and a lack of faith in the legal system can translate into its opposite. And by some measures, that's where we are today. Uh, according to a 2021 Pew Center study, of uh, people belonging to the 20 most advanced economies, Americans reported the highest percentage of racial and ethnic conflict, the second highest percentage of a perception of religious conflict, the third highest perception of rural urban conflict, and 59% of them said that Americans cannot agree on basic facts. Now, I don't want to be an utter Cassandra, uh, in that report, they also, 86% of respondents said that they think racial and ethnic and religious and geographic diversity make the United States a better country. So what I think those sort of internally inconsistent uh, reports suggest to us is how very slippery the project is of balancing pluralism and cohesion, um, especially in a country that is as physically and metaphorically large as ours is. Uh, we may be so immersed in our own Americanness that we don't see ourselves clearly. Uh, so let's ask an Englishman, Hugh Laurie, what he thinks of us. America is a country that's too big to know itself. Someone living in Florida has got no idea what, how people behave or what they eat or how they dress in Oregon. It's, it's just so far away. Um, I think despite our size, most Americans do want to occupy some kind of shared middle space, and I would argue that that middle space exists exactly at the intersection between law as top-down expert engineering and law as bottom-up neighbor-to-neighbor conversation. Uh, if we want Oregonians and Floridians to share something fundamentally American, then it's unavoidable and it's desirable that we have a couple of top 
top-down commands, identifying for all of us some basic behavioral expectations and some basic values that uh, are reflected in American life. But at the same time, if we want Oregonians to know and feel known by each other, if we want to at least begin by being personal, then we need to reanimate the one site in American law that facilitates those neighbor-on-neighbor -neighbor conversations, uh, that personal injury jury site. And I think that Exhibit A in defense of this thesis is the state of Iowa itself. So um, if you look at personal injury dockets across the country, what you'll see is that Iowans are basically twice as likely as uh, people in, on average in the rest of the states to bring the kinds of lawsuits that require the enunciation of social norms. Um, defamation lawsuits, invasion of privacy lawsuits, assault and battery lawsuits. 38% uh, of our tort docket concerns those kinds of lawsuits as compared with 18% in other states. And I don't think this means that Iowans can't get along with each other. I think it means we care deeply about getting along with each other and we know we have to have those difficult conversations to figure out exactly how to do that. You know, what it is our neighbors expect of us in terms of that interpersonal, that mutual care, um, what we might call Iowa nice. Um, it also turns out that Iowa is better than a lot of other states at combating that problem from the early 20th century about the diversity of the jury pool. Uh, we're not perfect, but we're getting a whole lot better. In the most racially diverse counties in Iowa, um, our jury pools tend to be proportionately diverse. So we are not getting uh, the announcement of social norms that reflect one narrow kind of life. We are getting social norms that are reflecting a diversity of lives. Um, and I think, you know, it's no mistake, as I say, that Iowa, as a result, uh, feels like it has a, a great deal more social cohesion informally, you know, uh, in the parking lot of the high V than we might find in other states. Um, Iowa nice, uh, our neighbors tell us, is a real thing. It's a cherished thing, and it's something that people want to carry forward into future generations. I think it's no accident that our personal injury system seems to be facilitating the kinds of conversations that help us figure out what exactly Iowa nice demands of us on a daily basis. Um, it has been a, a real honor over the past many years to be thinking about issues of community care at the University of Iowa, a place that takes the study of care seriously and treats it as a real and important thing. Uh, and so for that reason, I want to give the final word in this beautiful music hall to a music man who is a fellow Hawkeye, uh, Meredith Wilson, who made Iowa's culture of care famous many decades ago. And there we are. Thank you so much.
Wow, that was terrific, both of you. Made me think about a lot of issues. I, I'm sure our audience would agree. Uh, one thing I have to ask you, though, Christina, what happened to the hair conflicts? Somehow they disappeared on that slide. What, to the what? Hair conflicts, conflicts about hair. It was one of your items, maybe, maybe no oh. one else noticed, but it somehow disappeared. I categorize so. that as miscellaneous. Yeah, oh, I don't know okay. why so many right. New Yorkers have things in their hair. I knew this it is... didn't fit under Beyonce, <laughs> so. Um, anyway, thank you both for sharing some of, the, some of the challenges and unique aspects of each of your work. I wonder if you can expand a little bit more about public trust. You both talked about the fact that there's this gap between what the public thinks about the work you're doing uh, and scholars like you and what academics and researchers think. And we might call that the trust gap. What, I don't know what you want to call it. But what do you do about that as researchers? Do you just ignore it? Or are you out there doing things? Are your students out there, colleagues out there? Is there a way forward to close that gap? Um, it's a big question. No, it, it's, it's, it's a very good question. I think, I mean, there's lots of layers, I think, to that question. So one is, I think, as researchers, I think that this is an overused phrase, but we have to get out of the ivory tower, right? And I think a lot of it is explain, a lot of, I mean, science in general, it's a lot, right? It comes at you a lot. It's hard to tease out the differences. The examples I gave of what does this result mean versus what this result means. And so I think we owe it to get out into the population and try to explain those things, right? I, I, and some of the great experiences I've had, I've talked to the Eastern Iowa Parkinson's group. It was like an ALS night with the Iowa Cubs. And what I find when I do that, it's not, if people don't understand it, but not for lack of wanting to understand it, they want somebody to come and explain that to them. And so I think, you know, that's one aspect of it. I, I think the other is we can find ourselves in a bubble, like especially not just at the university, but Iowa City. Iowa City is very different, you know, from the rest of Iowa. And, you know, I first came here um, after undergrad. I worked in Keokuk for a year at an automotive plant. And, you know, the people who worked the plant floor didn't have PhDs, they didn't have MDs. But they're just as bright as a lot of the people I work with here. And so I think having those conversations and explaining what things mean and that there are no hard and fast truths in science. We know what we know as of today and what we know as tomorrow may change what we know today, which comes across as a little confusing as well. But I think if you have those conversations and bring people in, it's similar to, I think, the point Christina made about the jury process, then they feel like they're part of the research and the dissemination. Yeah, I agree. I think jurors can be great ambassadors if they have participated in a trial. Um, but beyond that, I, I mean, I think if you do have um, in law or, you know, in, in science, if you do have people who are experts who are promulgating rules or findings, um, I think that's where we turn to the folks over at that School of Mass Communications and Journalism, and we count on them to be uh, honest brokers and good faith translators, uh, but we have to help them. I mean, we've got to be willing to return those calls on deadline and spend, you know, 30 minutes explaining something and trying to help make sure they get it right. Um, I do think that the unfortunate, you know, the, the kind of 24-hour news cycle combined with the fact that, at least in law, these judicial opinions, thanks to word processing that used to be 10 pages are now 90 pages, right? It's very hard for somebody to translate that in a good faith way, and I think lawyers and courts could be better partners in that process. Can either of you, or maybe both of you, describe ways you've done that with students that you work with? I mean, I think you're both right. You gotta get out of the bubble, and, and even the Iowa City bi bubble, right? Because um, Iowa City's a little different than some of the outlying areas even in, in the state of Iowa, but have you helped your students to think about translating and communicating, and if so, how? Uh, well, I, I, there is one area in particular where I, and I sometimes say this to my first year, first semester tort students, um, we talk about a concept known as constitutional tort. Um, it's not something that's usually covered in the first year curriculum, but it has been very much in the news lately because it has to do with uh, police-civilian relations. And, and I do say to them, 
you know, in some ways now, you're going to go home at Thanksgiving and legal issues that are very much in the popular conversation, people are going to expect you to be able to say something about it. This one's in the popular conversation right now. So let's devote half a class and learn a little bit about it so that you can, you know, talk about it in a way that is helpful um, and brings people to the table together. And I think in, in my field, I can work in clinical trials and statistics in general. I think one of the things that I try to integrate like in terms of assignments and tests is that I don't need you to just tell me the answer in statistical terms, but in, you know, in the quote real world, you're going to be working with clinicians, with other scientists, where you're going to need to explain what you did, what you found, and what it means in non-statistical language. And I think that is a very hard skill especially in graduate school when you're kind of in like a bubble with your peers and we can throw stat terms around and everybody gets it. Uh, and so I think part of it is, is, you know, having them write out their answers like on exams and do that. But also, I mean, in our department, even beyond just individual teaching, we emphasize that our students have graduate research assistantships and so that they're working with those other individuals. And, you know, I think most of my colleagues in the department would agree that the experience our students get through those efforts is just as meaningful, if not more so, than what they get in the classroom because you're, you're working with those where you have to interact with and explain what you've, what you've done. And who you're, who you're talking to today may be different than tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Audience sensitivity, I think, is something that we're always talking about when we talk about legal writing and so forth. You know, who are you trying to persuade or inform? I think, was it Einstein who said, and I, and I say this to my students all the time, so I sure hope it was Einstein. Um, you know, if you can't explain something to a six-year-old, that means you don't understand it. Um, and it's super easy to rely on verbiage to, you know, kind of tell ourselves we understand something, but if you can boil it down and make it make sense to a beginner's mind, like, you have to really synthesize and digest it in order to be able to spit it back in that distillation. Um, and I think that's a great uh, uh, exercise to work through. Yeah, and if any place should be able to teach that, it should be the writing university, right, that really thinks about audience analysis, I hope. Um, can you talk a little bit about the word expert? So it seems as if we're in a period right now where a lot of people are challenging the idea of what an expert is, whether we need experts, whether experts actually know anything. So do you, do you think that's a term that's helping us, and is there anything you think we can do to battle the public sense, some public members, that expertise is maybe a bad thing? I mean, I can start. I think, I mean, from my personal perspective, I think saying someone has expertise in something is different than saying someone is an expert in something. And I think expert has a lot of negative connotation. And almost if I'm an expert in this, that means I know more about this than you do. And I think part of it comes across that from that aspect of it. So I think having expertise means I have some understanding. I can help you understand it. So, I, you know, I, it's a great question, one I actually haven't thought that deeply about. But I do think expert has some negative connotations in terms of this is an expert on X. And I, I believe no matter, to take that further, no matter what our expertise is in, I don't think we're ever an expert in the area, right? There's constantly more to learn or something you don't know. Some yeah. humility there is probably important, <laughs> yeah. right? I think so. Please. Well, I mean, I, I think a lot of it has to do with um, who is centered uh, in a particular area of inquiry. So um, I think there, human centered design is something I've been thinking about and learning a little bit about lately. Um, the idea being that, you know, the center. Um, the, the focal interest in human-centered design is the person who's going to use whatever is being designed, whether it's a product or a drug or a system or whatever it might be. So the person designing it might be good at sort of futzing with the chemicals. I know what you do is more than futzing, but you know. Um, but, but the idea is it's not good if it doesn't serve the person who's using it. And I think just shifting that sort of frame of reference as to who is the, you know, what is the locus of our energies um, does a lot of good follows from that. I think it introduces that humility that you're talking about. It helps people feel that, you know, this is not something that's being done to them, but something that's being done for them and with them. And I think that um, can go a long way. I, I think to, to add, as you said, like the word humility, I think one of the challenges we have as acad academicians, 
I'm not sure if I said that right, <laughs> is, uh, is it's important in terms of what we're talking about here, but it's almost counter to the way we often expect people to behave inside you know, the academic environment and that for, I think especially for junior faculty, being too humble can be seen as negative, right? You want to be knowledgeable and you want to come across as sure, which is the opposite of what you, we want you to do when you go out. So I think in particular, it's a bit of a challenge in that you kind of have competing pressures in terms of like within, especially pre-tenure, you're trying to impress people, you're trying to show that you know what you're doing. You know, one of the, I think one of the criteria for promotion in many departments is being an expert in an area, right? Which goes back to your point originally. We change it to expertise, That's right. I think, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we do that in graduate school and professional school as well, right? Yeah. Maybe some of our undergrads would say we do that in undergraduate classes too, yeah. you know? Yeah. The person who talks the most and sounds the most informed is the expert, and actually that's not always true, right? And you mentioned like social media and stuff, and I think it's even more true today. I don't have to know what I'm talking about if I sound like I know what I'm talking about. Scary. Um, you both touched on this a little bit, probably Chris, you a little more, but why Iowa? Why are you here, and what does Iowa provide for you as scholars in the work that you do? Yeah, I mean, for I, I would have never predicted Iowa, to be honest, uh, growing up. Um, I think the, the, the big thing that changed, the two things that kind of led me here, one, I mentioned in passing a few minutes ago the experience in Keokuk one summer because I graduated in December and had, you know, to kill some time before going to graduate school. It was like my first time on my own small town. It was a great experience for me. And so, I mean, Keokuk's not a big town. And so, because I was single on my own, anything within like a 200 mile radius of Keokuk, I did that summer. So lots of, lots of road trips. But I had that connection. And then when my wife and I, um, after I got my degree, we were living in Birmingham with a job and I was doing clinical trials. And I, I remember having a, c a conversation with her one weekend about what my ideal job would be. And within like a couple of weeks, there was an ad because the dissenter, Bill Clark, who I showed before was gonna retire, they were looking for a new director. It was exactly what I had described to Beth. And so, you know, it was the fact that Iowa wasn't this strange place. The winters we were a little concerned about. Um, she reminds me of that every time we do that. But it was that piece plus I had gone to graduate school in Chapel Hill. I like the feel of a college town, right? And the Iowa City very much has that. Uh, even more than Chapel Hill now, which has kind of grown much bigger. And it's a great place to raise a family. So I think, you know, all of that together, it's professionally was, was you know, the right place for me. I think it was the right place for our family. Iowa City, you, you mentioned the writing workshop, but it's got strong medical research, strong, you know, liberal arts side with writing. So it's like the, the vibrancy of downtown Iowa City on any given day is almost unlike any other college town I've been to. And so all of that just... You know, and I like sports, and Iowa sports are fun. Um, so you know, we know you definitely. like basketball. <laughs> That's right. How about you, Christy? Um, well, I think that reverence for the written word as a former reporter, and uh, you know, it just shines through in in every aspect of life at the university and at the broader city. Um, our wonderful law librarian, uh, and, our, and our law library is just a, a jewel uh, in the crown over at Boyd, but our wonderful law librarian, Carissa Vogel, refers to the law library as the beacon of the prairie. And I mean, I really think that's what the, the university is, it, in embracing the idea that speaking and writing and you know, that thinking um, really does light um, the darkness, and I think that is just taken very seriously here at Iowa. And I think you know that Iowa nice really does uh, cash out uh, in a very discernible way. When I was on the entry level law teaching market as a you know a 50 year old, if you can imagine such a thing, um, I, when I interviewed with Iowa. Um, every other school that I interviewed with, um, you know, you go in with your job talk paper and it's like blood sport. They just can't wait to challenge you and tell you how you're wrong. How they're more expert than, exactly than you are. Exactly correct. And I remember very clearly that the folks at Iowa, the very first thing they said was, I really enjoyed this. I thought it was so interesting and great. And just that, that simple reach across the aisle, um, you know, I relaxed. I, I spoke more you know, knowledgeably and enthusiastically, and my work was better because I felt like I was in a collaborative setting, even in the interview. And I think that, you know, is very typical of the culture here. And I think it leads to better work. That's great. 
So in the past, the presidential lecture was one person, and we've kind of been changing it up recently, at least since I've been here, where we invite one more, two, or we've even had three, I think two is a better number, uh, people to share their work. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what you've gotten to know about each other and maybe how your work looks different as you've bounced some things across each other from two di very different disciplines. You didn't know each other before this, mm -hmm. did you? Not at all. So what's this experience been like for you? I think it's remarkable, uh, the synergies that we found between our work. I mean, really, at that first meeting when we both realized that trials are conducted in sort of a three-phase um, progression, that was kind of striking. And then when I you know, was looking a little bit more into the history of the rules to discover that they were aiming to be scientific. Like, that was fascinating and um, not something I would have been on the lookout before meeting Chris. Uh, we were talking just last week about, um, you know, this idea that when you are doing um, sort of multi-phase trials, um, that the resolution of one particular trial um, can be sort of like a diffuse signal uh, that gives you an opportunity to then do a second one and see if you're reaching the same result. So it, the stakes are a little bit lower, but the body of knowledge that's generated is a little bit more authentic. And we were kind of commenting on how that, that you know, is true across both disciplines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I concur with much of what Christine said. I think first and foremost, it was great getting to know like a, another faculty member. I, we would have probably never interacted if not for this. And I think it's been great doing this, but also I think in, in terms of what I've taken from it, seeing the similarities, I mean, the way something moves through, it's interesting, there's kind of a mirror image in that, you know, the legal system, you're innocent until proven guilty, you know, with the current regulatory framework, a drug is guilty until proven innocent in order to give it, but I also think, like, some of the things that Christine, Christina touched on about the top-down versus bottom-up, and I think a lot of the tension that I touched on at the end of the talk in terms of the regulatory framework, the top down was needed, especially in the 60s, to protect us. A lot of what's coming up now is the bottom up. And like particularly there are things that, um, where that's really, I think, coming home now are, you know, a lot of the things that were done in COVID to get treatments available faster because there was an urgency, it was a global pandemic. And a lot of groups who have seen the FDA explain for years, this is the way you do it have said, you know, maybe not on a global level, but for those with our disease, it's just as urgent to us. Why can't we do this? And so I think we're seeing much more of that vocalization and a lot of the similarities. So it was actually, before we met, I was thinking, wow, law, <laughs> you know, <laughs> clinical trials. And it's amazing. I mean, they're almost so intertwined in how the similarities are that it was kind of fascinating to kind of put those pieces together. Yeah, we've, we've, we've occupied a lot of sort of, um, exit vestibules, got, getting stuck in conversations where we're realizing right. how much similarity there is over the past several months, so, yeah. Well, I think that's fascinating, and we, you know, we do try to weave the talks together, but we don't start with that premise, so it's fun when it occurs naturally. You know, as both of you were talking, I was hearing some reactions from some people in the audience about sort of the despair of, of the world right now, or let's just say of the work that you're talking about, the perceptions of, you know, judges or of lawyers maybe, um, the, the sense that science isn't real or should, fake news, or I, maybe I shouldn't use that phrase, but people don't believe anything anymore. So how do you um, help the audience think in a way that's more positive? And maybe you're not an optimist by nature, but I'm guessing you are the way that you both have come across today. What fuels your optimism in the face of some information and some work that you're doing that's not all that optimistic? I, I mean, so those who work with me will tell you I am far from an optimist, so <laughs> I'll try to take an optimistic uh, approach. I, I do think that it, I mean, I think there are like a pocket of individuals who would purposely try to mislead, right, and all of that. But I think a lot of it comes from what we touched on earlier, just confusion, not understanding. Um, you know, and, and so I think part of the best we can do is to continue to work to try to do that and to continue with the communication. I think like one example, and, and some of my students are like in here, in, in class we've touched on this, the confusion when the vac vaccines were rolled out uh, in that, the threshold to get a vaccine approved 
is that it prevents a sufficient number of cases. It doesn't mean if you get the vaccine, you won't ever get it. But, you know, a lot of conversation was, well, I got the vaccine and I still got, you know, COVID. If you take even a strongly protective vaccine and you pump a lot of risk on it, you're going to see diseases. But I think if you break it down, that makes sense. But when you just see, I think there's a lot of, well, it's a vaccine. If I get the vaccine, I won't get it. And explaining what that means or how different things, you know, take place. What is, you know, the risk and, the, you know, the studies were done at a time when a lot of healthcare workers were enrolled who were at risk, but the overall risk, you didn't go, you know, the grocery store still had everyone locked down, masks and stuff. When the vaccines were rolled out, we were much more wide open. So your risk, your exposure was much higher. And so, you know, I just explained it kind of scientifically, I think in here, you know, to narrow it down. But I think the more we explain, the better it is. I also think it's hard to keep up with just the way technology changes, right? A big thing in science right now is open, open science, where there's a push towards, you know, putting preprints up, which was done for a good thing to try to get science out there faster, not wait on, you know, journal peer review and publication. But it also, I mean, with any good thing, there comes bad, right? That also means anybody can put any paper up on a site that's not been peer reviewed. And then a lot of times, if that's the one that gets magnified, people believe it's true. And to the general population, it's hard to tell the difference between two of those. And so I think, you know, some of this, we just have to keep up with where things are and do our best to do that and try to explain the differences as best we can. It, I don't think we'll completely ever solve it, but, you know, trying is worth doing. I believe in the power of an open-ended question. I mean, I think if we, are, if we go into spaces, academic spaces, social spaces, parking lots, the dry cleaner, and we are willing to ask each other open-ended questions and invite in enthusiasm about other people's lives, um, I think we learn from that. We open then people up mutually to hearing our stories and maybe accepting you know, things that we have studied and what we, how we might describe them um, with a little bit more, you know, that they're willing to be vulnerable if we're willing to be vulnerable. Um, I, 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 yeah, I, I just think that um, appreciating people where they are, taking them where they are, meeting them where we are, where they are is, is the only way we make a we out of a you and a me with, at the risk of being glib, but I, I think but to tie I believe on it. with that, with what you said before, I think that's part of, it, I, I'm, if I think I'm an expert, right, we're not having that conversation, but if I'm an expert, I can be wrong, right? And so part of it is realizing that sometimes what we think is wrong and being able to accept that in conversation and listen to other people's opinions. Well, I'm, I for one am really proud that you're both members of our great faculty and that you're, you have humility and you care about these issues and you're working at the interface of expertise and public goods. So thank you so much. Please join me in thanking our lecturers for the 41st presidential lecture. Thank you. I invite you to join us for a reception outside of this great hall and to ask more questions of our great speakers today. Thanks so much again for coming.